Uh, this is not a sermon series. This is what I call a standalone message. This is just something that I really believe God has laid on my heart, but also something as, as I've been reading and studying God's Word, this is just something that I believe is the right timing for us. And uh, this sermon series, there, this uh, message is just called Run. And if you don't know Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, uh, if you do know that, you realize it's pretty simple of a title, didn't go too deep there. Uh, but if you've never heard this, I'm going to read this to you in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, and we're going to go right into God's Word, and we're going to get after it this morning. So this is what Scripture says. It says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great, a, such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and, ha and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I feel that this is one of the most stirring passage of scriptures. It is a passage that is written for the purpose to stir us to run and to keep on running this, this race called life, especially the Christian race called life. That this is to stir us and to get us going, to remind us that we are to run and we are to run this thing called life well. Now, so what is this Christian race that we're in? If you are a Christ follower in this room, uh, I mean, it can be described in many different ways. It is a race for heaven called the eternal life. It is a, it's, it's potentially the race for life, the abundant life. But then it's also, it's a race to know God the very best that you can and to please him. It is really what this whole race that they're talking about here is us really living life the very best that we can for God, getting to know God better with the ultimate goal is the finish line is heaven. That is what we're talking about. And we are to run this race called life, and we're to run it for God, and we're to run it well. And that this scripture tells us, this passage of scripture tells us how we are to do this. See, we believe in God and his great promise of living with him forever and ever. We believe in God's grace, uh, glorious promise of this perfected eternity called heaven. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 says this, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And that promise is a life of eternity with him in heaven. See, we know that if we will endure to the end, we will be escorted into the very presence of God where we will live with God forever. So the point of this passage of scripture, it really demands our attention. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 really does demand our attention as Christ followers in this room. And if you aren't, you don't consider yourself a Christ follower. If you don't consider yourself a Christian, I'm telling you, this is a great passage of Scripture to kind of stir something up in your life. See, this great Christian race, it lays out before us. And therefore, we need to study it. We need to understand it by, who, by all that are willing to. To run it, and listen to me, all need to be running this race for God. Not just be willing, but be willing, but also to do it and to do it well. See, we can run this thing called life in a lot of, lot of different ways. Over the past few weeks, I've, I've, uh, I've been, been doing a little bit of traveling. We've uh, been here, there, been a couple leadership things, been, been a couple family things. So I've had a, a lot of like what I would call windshield time and just, just driving down the road. And I was listening to this leadership podcast and he mentioned this button that I have in my car as well. And it's the, the, the eco button. You know, it's that little button on the sign that's got the little green little flower and it says eco on it. And that when you push it, it kind of it's supposed to help your car run more fuel efficient. But it also is when you have that button's pushed and you're, at a, and you're at a stop sign or a stoplight and you try to punch it, you really can't punch it. You just kind of go, so it allows you to do it. And it got me thinking that, that I also, my car, and I, we were in Audrey's car and it has that button, but in my car, the car that I, that, that, that's mine, I have these two little paddles 
underneath my steering wheel. And, and on my gear shift, there's this little slot on there that has an S, and it's, called, it's for sports mode. And I can use those little paddles, and man, you can get, I mean, it's, it's like the old five speeds. But it's here now. Okay, everybody's following me, right? Okay, you're getting it. And so you can get, and I thought about it when I began to read this passage of scripture that we can, we can do this thing, run this race of life a lot of different ways. We can run it in eco mode, which it could be safe. It can be a little bit more efficient on our life. You know, we'll make it to heaven and we'll love God along the way, but we're just going to kind of leave, we're going to live this life a little bit safe or we can live this life and we can drop it into sports mode. We can use the little paddles and we can get after it. Because there's a difference. I mean, we can live life and we can cruise through life loving God and, and, and you know, kind of doing the church thing and doing the God thing. And, and we can be in eco mode or we can be in sports mode and we can get after chasing God and seeing what God wants for our life and be passionate about God and love God with all of our heart, mind, soul and strength. And man, we can do the will of God in our life and not be on cruise control, not be in eco mode, but be in sports mode after God. I mean, we have a choice. I mean, we can cruise through things or we can get after it. See, the key is this. You don't want to get past in this thing called this, this race of life because of the lack of passion. Because if we truly will have passion for God, it will change the way we live our life. I mean, we won't be cruising through life. I mean, we will be getting after it, chasing God with all that we've got. See, this passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 12, it is to stir us and inspire us to run this race called life, believing we are running with a purpose of finishing it and finishing it well. Because if you like it or not, we're all on this race. You just get to choose how you're going to run it and who you're going to run it for. Because there is going to be a finish line for all of us. I mean, at some point, we're all appointed to die. I mean, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And we get to choose from this point or hopefully before this point, you've chosen to say, hey, I'm going to be in this race, this Christian race, because I'm already running it. I might as well, my goal might as well be heaven. And we might as well run after God with all we got in sports mode and getting after it. And we might as well do it well. So I believe this passage of scripture should inspire us, stir us up. To run this life, to run this race called life and run it with purpose. So, if you got your notes, how do you run this race and how do you do it well for God? Number one is this you've got to become weightless. You've got to become weightless. <clears throat> Back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says this Let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us. See, we must lay aside every weight and lay aside the sin that can trap us. Now, the words lay aside in the original language, it means to take off, to strip off, and to remove as in taking off clothes. Now, it's going to state the obvious. We're not talking about running around with no clothes on. I'm not saying that. But if you're hearing that, you didn't hear it right. But what I am saying is this. There are things in life that can entangle us and weigh us down. They can be weight for us to move from one place to another. And as a Christ follower, we must strip off every weight. That means any excess weight that isn't helpful. Things that may be, maybe even be legitimate or innocent, but they hinder your life for Christ. They hamper and slow you down instead of helping you run faster. What, so what kind of things could those be? What are some of those legitimate and innocent things? Things that do not help you as a believer in Christ to grow and run this race as fast as you can. Now, when I first started putting this sermon together, I had a list. I had a list of things that, that I felt were things that could hinder us, that were innocent Maybe some people would say, well, is that even really sin? And it may fall into that gray area. And, and I took all of that out. 
Because this is what I'm doing. I am trusting that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this very moment of things that may be hindering you, that are weighing you down, that you know what, they may look good, they may not be bad, but they are weighing you down from running this race for Jesus the very best that you can. I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this very moment and saying, hey, that's what he's talking about. I've been trying to tell you about this. Because there's a lot of things, and I've used this terminology, and I'm going to continue to use it. There's a lot of things in life that we can do. But as Christ followers, should we be doing them? I mean, there's a lot of things we can do, and we can say, well, they fall into the Bible. It doesn't just say, don't do that. And we call that the gray area. Can we do them? Yeah. But should we be doing them as a Christ follower? Are they helping us run this race to the very best of our ability? Are they help, is, is it helping us run faster for Jesus, going after God more, and our passion going out through the roof for God? Is it really helping us? Job chapter 11 verse 14 says this, Get rid of all your sins and leave all iniquity behind you. We've got to get rid of those things that don't belong in our life that are weighing us down. Now, going back to that scripture, the, the, the one part it says, and, and also, in the sin which easily ensnares us. Now, again, going back to the original language, this means that the sin which clings, distracts, entangles, and trips us up. So we go from the things that, that weigh us down, that may, that, that we know some things that are not good for our life, that way we know to get rid of them, but also the innocent, maybe not so sinful things, those things weigh us down as well. And if they're causing what we got to get rid of, but also scripture says there's sin that can trip us up. There's sin which clings to us. There's sin that will entangle us as we try to run this race. Now, it's the picture of clothing, this whole entangling thing, this easily ensnare. It's like clothing flapping around a person while they're trying to run. Now, I've never wore a dress and tried to run in a dress. But I picture this of someone that is in a dress or even in biblical times where their, 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 their shirts, I don't even know what they were called. I probably should have know that. But they're longer. And I'm trying to picture someone running and they get caught up because they can't take strides and they can't go as fast as they want to and it trips them up. I mean, it's almost like having a shoelace untied and it being stepped on while you're trying to run and you trip yourself up on those things. See, it's those things that entangle and trip you up, causing you to fall. So what is that sin that entangles you? And it's tripping you up for running this race the very best that you can. See, various sins have been suggested as common to all believers. But however, the writer of Hebrews is speaking strongly to every believer and to particularly the sin that entangles and trips you up personally. Because there's the big sins that we all know about. Well, we don't do that. We don't do that. The big ten, you know, we try to, we, we guard ourselves. But there's sin that trips us up personally that may be a sin that I deal with, but maybe you don't deal with. Or maybe there's a sin that, that you struggle with that, that I don't. We have to understand that whatever those sins are that trip us up, that attach to us, that cling to us, we have to get rid of those in our life so we can run this race the very best that we can. We've got to do it. And you're like, well, pastor, man, you're talking about sin. Man, that starts getting a little personal. Man, sin is sin. And just let me tell you, we all deal with it. We just can't let sin control our lives. We can't let sin dictate how we run this thing called life for God. That we cannot let, let it weigh us down whatsoever. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 21 says this. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Are you listening? Which is corrupt by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. 
and put on this new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Now, what that scripture is telling us is the same thing. Get rid of the sin in your life. Well, Jacob, I've been dealing with this. I've tried, I've tried. Keep trying. Keep going after God. Figure out how to get rid of that sin in your life. If you need someone to pray with you, if you need an accountability partner, you've got to figure that out. But we have got to not allow sin to weigh us down, to entangle us, so it trips us up on this thing called life. Each one of us must ask, what is the sin that easily trips me? Is it pleasure? Indulgence? Is it my words? My desires? Pride? Possessions? Friends? Television? Maybe it's a hobby. What is it that consumes my energy and keeps me from following God fully and wholly? What is it that trips me up far, far too often? Romans chapter 6 verse 12 says this, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. See, you must strip it off or else it will entangle you and trip you up and you potentially may never finish this race the way you want to finish it. It will definitely trip you up and entangle you that you don't get to run the race the way you want to run this race, which is full of passion and in sports mode for God. We have to become weightless. We must strip this sin off or else it will entangle you and trip you up. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 says this, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners in exiles, let me stop there. What this is saying is, you're saying a foreigner, or exile, what is this? This is, this is the thing is, this earth, this is not our home. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, heaven is your home. Scripture actually tells us that we are just pilgrims passing through. That you say, well, if you know, man, well, I live a life so long. It doesn't matter how long you think a long life is. If that's 50, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110 years, no matter what you think along, it's still just a vapor. It still comes and goes as it compares to eternity, which is forever and ever. So we got to understand that, that, that just as we are foreigners, that we are not meant to live, we're not meant to live forever here on this earth. We are to, meant to live forever in heaven. We are to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against our soul. We can't allow the things, the sinful things, to trip us up, to entangle us, to keep us from running this race the very best that we can. We must strip off all unnecessary weight. We must become weightless. So how do we run this race and do it well? Become weightless. And number two is this. We have to have endurance. Back to Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. It says, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In another translation, the words used for run with endurance is actually run with patience and that word patience again and i know i'm using a lot of the original language but there's just such great going back to what the original word meant uh and when, when you, you look at hebrew and greek and you go back and you study that and you do a word study and you see all what this word really really means to us it's very powerful and so i try not to do too much of that but this was too good not to share with you on this passage of scripture so it really means run with patience, which that word in the original language does mean endurance. It means fortitude. It means steadfast, steadfastness. Say that three times. It means consistency. It means perseverance. See, the word patience also is this. It's not passive. It is an active word. It's not the attitude that we just sit back and, and, and just when the trials of life come our way, we just go, woe is me, oh, look at poor me, life is hard. It really is saying it takes another approach. Rather, it's the attitude that stands up and faces the trials of life head on, knowing that we can conquer and overcome because Jesus lives inside of us. That's what it's about. So when trials come and it, it, stir, it should stir something up in inside of us, not to feel as woe as me, life is hard, what am I supposed to do? It's supposed to stir something inside of us that says, come on, if that's what you got, I got a bigger God, that I've got endurance, 
that trials of life are going to come. Because guess what? We cannot be naive to the fact that we're going to have trials in life. I mean, it is. If you've not had them, you will. And if you've already had some, unfortunately, I'm here just to lift you up. You may have more. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. Every forms and fashion, trials come. And they don't come announcing, you don't get like an email and say, hey, next week, hey, a trial's going to come. Man, they come busting down the door. And you're like, poof, you get hit in the face. And you're like, where did that come from? But you know what? There should be something. If we are running this race with passion, and we're running this race for God, we should have some endurance to say, you know what? We know they're coming. So when they come, man, we're not going to sit back and go, woe is me. We're not going to sit back and say, feel sorry for me. What we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, here we go. We're going to face that because that word endurance, that word patience, it's not passive. It is active. So as Christ followers, we must have staying power. We can't let the trials of life knock us off this thing called this, this race that we're in. I'll never forget, I, I, uh, both of my kids ran track in high school, and I, I, I love going to track meets. I mean, they're just, I mean, there's just something about going to a track meet where you just see just raw athleticism. I mean, I mean. You mean just you, kids that can run and jump and do all that? They're just athletes. And I'll, I'll never forget, I was watching, I don't know, one of my kids run. And, 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 and I'll never forget, they were running around the, the first curve of, of the track. And they were running. And it wasn't them, but they were in this race. A kid got bumped. Next thing you know, he is in the middle of the track because they were taking that curve. And when he got bumped, it sent him into, so it must have been my son, sent them into the middle of the, the track. Now, he didn't do it. It wasn't the guy that fell. I just remember watching that. And do you know what? When trials of life come and they bump us, we can let them knock us into the infield of this thing called race and take us out. Take us out of the race. And we can lay on the ground and we can look at our scratches and we can look at the bumps. We can look at the bruises and we can go, poor me. Look what someone did to me. Look what life did. This is not fair. We can have that attitude. And, and don't get me wrong. There's some things that happen to good people. I don't know why. And it's, and it's, it's just the facts of life. It's not fair. But it, it, we just have to deal with it. Or we can get back up like that kid that day got back up, got back on the track, even though... He limped, he finished that race that day. People cheered, people clapped, people hollered. He had blood coming down the leg. He was limping, had a couple tears coming down his face because he had trained hard for that race. But guess what? Just because he got bumped because of a trial, it didn't knock him out of the race. He got back up. It's the same thing for you and I, that we have to make the choice. When trials come, we can sit back and we can get knocked off the track of life, or we can literally get up and say, you know what? I may be bloody. Man, I got some tears because I'm hurting, but I'm going to keep running. It may not be as fast as it was, but you know what? I'm going to keep running, and I'm going to keep having passion. I'm going to keep chasing God. I'm going to keep going after God, and I'm going to keep going because the trials of life may bump me, but they're not going to knock me out <clears throat> because I'm going to have endurance we must have stay in power we must be filled with endurance letting nothing stop or hinder us not any sin distraction desire enticement no luring invitation no appealing attraction no challenges no worldly opportunity we are going to keep going after God and running this race the very best that we can because we are going to have endurance to chase God Luke chapter 21 verse 19 says this, By standing firm, you will win your souls. By standing firm, you will win. I mean, the great thing here is inspiration for this race. Inspiration for this race. Back to Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. It's the very beginning of this verse. It says, and, and I know I'm kind of jumping around verse 1, but it kind of it fit. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So you got to picture this. She's like, so what, what does this mean? Picture this as a race, and the scene is this great coliseum filled with capacity with spectators. This great cloud of witnesses. This crowd 
that this scripture is talking about are actually the heroes of faith from chapter 11, right before chapter 12. For chapter 11 is filled with heroes of faith, of the things that they did for God. People that live for God, people that, man, they, they, they walk the walk, they talk the talk, and man, they finish their race well. And so, this great cloud of witnesses that actually participated in this race called life, they have run and they finished the race themselves. They enduring to the end and winning. Therefore, they are the witnesses and examples for us. Witnesses who believe God and stood fast for God. They stood fast against all kinds of trials, temptations, and opposition. I mean, their great faith and endurance should stir and inspire us to believe and to endure with all of our belief in God. That when we read Hebrews chapter 11 and we read Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 and it says, hey, there's this great cloud of witnesses there. We can look to them as an example and it should stir us up to say, hey, if that guy can do it, if that woman can do it, guess what? So can I. But then also, <clears throat> there's people that God put in our life that we look to as heroes. Maybe you got a parent. Maybe you got a grandparent. Maybe you got a friend. Maybe you got a, a former Christian leader in your life that you look to and say, man, they ran this life and they chased God. And man, they didn't do it perfect, but man, they did it well and they finished this race and I want to be like that. They can be your example. They can be. Just like these heroes. It's this great cloud of witnesses that are saying, hey, you got this. I've done it. You can too. See, the, these people, this great faith and endurance should stir and inspire us to believe and endure. See, because this great cloud of witness, they endured great temptation against looking, touching, tasting, doing, thinking, feeling, and saying anything that would hinder their running this race. They did not give in to temptation, at least not for long, not as a lifestyle, and not permanently. They endured, they had endurance to finish the race. These people, they endured great trials against problems, troubles, sufferings, loss, hunger, disease, accidents, mockery, abuse, persecution, threats, and even being a martyr, which means they were killed for their faith. But no matter how terrible or awful the trial was, they endured in faith, believing in God and His glorious His promises. I mean, they're examples for us. They also endured all opposition against, against opposition from family, friends, neighbors, fellow workers, civil, lever, civil leaders, and even institutional religious people. But no matter the opposition, they believed God and they endured in their faith in God and in His word of His promise and they ran this race and they ran it well and they ran it to completion. And I'm telling you, we do all of this for this one reason. So that one day... When we finish this race and we stand before our God, when we stand there and He can say these words to us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in. That's why we run this race. That's why we have to run it weightless. That's why we got to get rid of all of this mess that we have, the sin, the things that don't belong in our life. That's why we have to have endurance and not let the trials that life throws our way Knock us off. I'm going to close with this right here. If our worship team, you can come. So how do we run this race and run it well? We got to become weightless. We have to have endurance. And number three is this. We got to look to Jesus. Amen. Hebrews 12 and 2 says this. <clears throat> it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, there is a supreme example of the way the race, the, to run this race and to run it well. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, Christ followers, you have, who have trusted God and have you endured in your faith, you're a great example for other people. The saints that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, the friends and family that we just talked about, all great examples. But there's no one better of an example of how to run this race called life like Jesus Christ. He is the supreme. We are to look to Him. 
You know, we may and we should look at the example of other believers, but we should always be looking to Jesus. <clears throat> that word looking, it literally means to fix your eyes on Jesus. And it also means that you are to fix your mind upon Him. That we are to look to Him and think about Him of how we are to run this race. See, we're to focus our eyes and our mind on Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ himself ran this race of faith when he was here on this earth. He shows us exactly how to run it. See, we have to remember this. That Jesus participated in this thing called life. You remember he was born to Mary and Joseph in the manger? That he grew up as a baby, as a toddler, as a little kid. As a junior hire, as a high schooler, as a young adult, he's lived the life and he did it and he did it well. Scripture says that he is the author and finisher of our faith. The author means this, that he authored it. He began it. He originated. He created. And he gave birth to this whole thing called the Christian life. But then also it says that he is the finisher, which means he perfected and he completed this race. And he ran this race to the finish. He started it and he finished it and he did it right and he did it well. Well, you're saying, well, Jacob, are you telling me I got to be like Jesus? We got to try. Are we ever going to come and be perfect like him? No. But if, we, if, if, if our target and our goal is not here... We're never even going to reach here. If our goal is here, then guess what? We're going to reach here. So if we're looking for to be more like Christ in our life, you know what? We're never going to have that perfection until we get to heaven. But you know what? We could sure run this race a whole lot better if we try to be like Jesus. If we strive to run this thing called life a lot more like him. He is the blazing example of our faith in God. Our dependency, our obedience, our righteousness. We are always to be looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says this. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So how do we run this race and do it well? Become weightless. Have endurance. And look to Jesus. A great message from Pastor Jacob. We pray that the Lord spoke to you through it. Now we would love for you to connect with us through Facebook and Instagram at Cobble First Assembly. And if you'd like to give, we have three ways to do that in person, online, or through text to give. Those will be linked in the description box below. Thank you for joining CFA Online this week, and we hope to see you again next time.